These stories sometimes contain mature content and language for adult audiences. Listener discretion is advised. I believe that making that step to get out of my comfort zone allowed me to know that I could do it at any get out of my comfort zone allowed me to know that I could do it at any point. It's not to say that it's easy. It's just to say that you, you survive it. You, you know, the world doesn't fall apart and you gain so much from it. If you're willing to be, you think they will. Sometimes they're much better. Sometimes they're <laughs> really awful and you go, okay, well, maybe that wasn't such a great idea. And then you just sort of pick yourself up and go, okay, so what's next? Well, welcome to Digging Deep, True Stories of Big Change. Each episode of this podcast digs deep into one person's story of change to reveal a little bit about how and why we make big changes in our lives and what can be learned from these experiences. I'm your host, Kelly Styring, founder and principal researcher from Insight Farm, a consultant companies learn from their customers and consumers through deep conversation and connection, often told as stories like the one you'll hear on this podcast. So let's get the conversation started. Our guest today is Fran Ahn. She's a communications and public relations professional. Fran works in internal communications with an international finance organization. I'm very pleased to welcome her today to tell her story. Thinking about the story that you'll be telling today, why don't we start with your headline? If you were writing a headline for your story, what would that headline be? She had a small life with big adventures. Excellent. I want to know all about that adventure. adventure. So why don't you start just by telling your story in your own words? Okay. In 1991, I was working in business development at the time in a personal trust department at a very large bank in South Carolina. And Kipplinger had a post about people joining Peace Corps who were business volunteers. It had never occurred to me that that would be something I would do, being the capitalist that I was and ready to go make money and see the world from the financial perspective and ready to go make money and see the world from the financial perspective. I was surprised that I decided to look into that. I was at the age where I was turning uh, the milestone age of 30 and I wanted desperately to get out of South Carolina also to leave a very bad relationship. I wanted a complete change, something that would drastically upend my life. And so I joined the Peace Corps. And so in joining the Peace Corps, you mentioned that it was a specific business program, but do you have in program, but do you have influence over where you go and what you do? It varies. The Peace Corps typically has, at least when I was involved, they had specific regions that they wanted to find volunteers to, to place. And at the time, they were looking at Central and East Stock, which is in Russia, but it's on the, this is the far, far edge of Russia, um, uh, East, so almost to <laughs> Alaska, I would say. And I was slated for that, but then things changed and that, that, got pushed to the next placement that came up was Czechoslovakia, which had not separated at the time. They did allow me to choose the Czech Republic. And so I actually did some research and went back to them and said, I'll take the Czech Republic. And from there, things began to move forward. Move forward. Did you, did you know what you were getting into at the time? Not at all. Uh, I knew that I was filling out in order to, to uh, apply, I filled out a lot of paperwork, Kelly. It was everything from how many accounting classes I ha had to the kind of skills that I was using in my current position. One of the requirements was that I had to have an MBA in at least five years of work experience. So I wasn't sure what I would be doing and just said, 
I need to go in and maybe all I'm doing and just said, I need to go in and maybe all I will do is make labels for, for newsletters, who knows, but I can figure it out. And so I went in with an open mind and just felt like exactly what it was, felt like it would be an adventure and it would. I was going to ask you about being ready for that. So, you know, a more traditional path from an MBA would be be recruited by a company and you were already working in financial services. Mm -hmm. So what do you think it was specifically? I mean, what type of adventure do you think you were looking for? It was a chance to work. It was a chance to travel internationally, to be in places I would never have thought would be possible. And it just seemed like the right time. I was not attached. I had to do a few other, a few other things. Peace Corps at the time required you to be debt free. So I had to uh, pay off some debt and I was ready to close up and move forward. In general, it was just the desire to find something different in my life. For doing this, did you, were there any systems? Did you build pluses and minuses lists? Did you talk to friends and family? Like what was your process of actually making a decision? Well, did you have a process? Yeah, my process was, okay, so I did read about it in Kip and Gerd newsletter. I did speak to some station already and I learned about his experiences and what he loved and what he hated about it. Um, probably one of the biggest influences was one of my sisters who is an incredible woman. My sister Therese was a puppeteer for a very long time, was a long time, was a puppeteer for 10 years. And she actually is someone I have always held in high esteem. She and I were talking one night and she said, I would do that if I could go. And at the time she was working at CNN, I was like, okay, if you, if you were going to do it, then I guess I should do it. So I'm going to go have this adventure. So it was probably that part of it that made me want to do it more than anything else. So. I'm wondering what the, what the rest of your family, <laughs> that's a great story. What were the rest of your family's reactions or your friends? How did they um, react? So I have six brothers and then there are the, the five, five girls, five, five girls, so four sisters. And my sisters were all incredibly supportive and said, yes, go do it. It's good for you. Go try, have an adventure. I do have another sister, my sister Lorraine, who spent time in the seventies traveling in Europe, mostly Germany singing to U.S. troops through Germany, singing to U.S. troops. So these were my role models, seeing these people who had these other big adventures in their lives. And to me, it seemed like I needed to go find an adventure myself. I think the only person who was really a bit confused might have been my father. Confused might have been my father because <laughs> he just thought, well, you know, you should stay here. And hang out but I knew that that wasn't for me do, so, do you think he was worried about you do you think did anyone express any concern about the political climate in that area of the world at that time and the um the velvet revolution had happened in 89 in the Czech in what was then Czechoslovakia and then the countries were finding their way. And by the end of 93, the countries actually split into the Czech and Slovak Republic. So they became separate nations. Everything seemed to be going very well in terms of the way things were happening in the nations. So it, and in that area of the world. So it did not seem so frightening as maybe some areas you would go. What was your work like? What was the name of the center? I ended up working with a women's business organization. Uh, in Czech, it was Associace Podnikatelic a Manageri, which was Association of Business Women and Managers. My job ranged from having holding weekly weekly meeting, holding weekly weekly meetings, creating newsletters, to mostly raising money. When I walked in the door, they said, we have a conference scheduled next year and you need to go raise money and put the program together. 
I was like, all righty then, <laughs> let me figure out how that works here. Exactly. What would you say were the, if you, if you can name them off the top of your head, what would you say were some of the successes that you feel like you accomplished during that time? And, and what were some of the things that, that could have been better? Absolutely. I believe one of my biggest successes was that conference. I believe one of my biggest successes was that conference. It ended up being a huge conference with women from Eastern and Western Bloc. It was a conference where all of the Peace Corps volunteers who were in my group helped with the whole program, with the whole program, with the whole conference itself. And we also opened it up to volunteers to the eastern part of the world as well. So there were volunteers from Romania and other places. And uh, I think the best part of it was the come That was the biggest part of it. The piece of it that I regret in terms of that particular project was my speaker I should have vetted the, the final guest speaker who was the speaker for the keynote. Um, edit the, the final guest speaker who was the speaker for the keynote. Um, probably should have vetted her speech more closely. I was very naive in believing that when people tell you they're going to talk about a specific topic, they will. So I learned that the hard way. But those things happen and you, you move on. The end was not what I expected. I came back to the U.S. very depressed, oddly. I walked away with knowing that there were many, many people who appreciated what I did. And I still have friends who are a part of my life. The woman I worked with directly has visited, directly has visited. The host family I lived with, I actually heard from one of the host sisters the other day on WhatsApp. So. You know, the world is very different from 1993 when I left. We do have internet now in a way that, we, that didn't exist. So Peace Corps volunteers today result and have connections in a way that we just didn't. There was so much, so much kindness and so much goodness in people. If you remember that it exists and culture and language don't have to be a barrier. And so how much language training did you have before you be a barrier? And so how much language training did you have before you went? Well, in country, I had three months of training. I am a terrible language student. I know how to ask for money in check and I know how to tell you to mm -mm, leave me alone. <laughs> so the important stuff to me was make the organization so I could ask for it in multiple languages, at least Czech and English. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Did your host about family um, speak English or did you have to figure out how to, how to live? Uh, one of the young, one, there were two daughters in the family. It was a mom and two daughters and a, a grandmother and grandfather. One of the daughters, the older daughter, one of the daughters, the older daughter, Bob, Barbara spoke English, which can be exhausting for a child to constantly have to have to translate. But like I said, language is not necessarily so difficult. One night, the grandmother, the babichka, took me to uh, the family had. I was actually in Moravia, which is sort of the wine country for the Czech Republic. So she took me and got me, got me very sauced, got me very drunk. And we, we spoke Czech and we had a great conversation. And I remember a great deal of it and understood her and was able to communicate in my very bad, funny, the way things happen. I would never be able to hold a conversation for longer than, you know, a how are you, yaksamate, but I know that a nice glass of vino will make it all work well. My host mom and one of the host sisters came to visit me a couple of years ago. So to visit me a couple of years ago. So I want very much to give people a wonderful experience when they come to the U.S. because mm -hmm. there were so many who treated me so well. I think that this experience affected you long term. How do you think it shaped the way you think about the world or business or did it change you at all? I believe that it did. I remember I, I listened to the BBC a great deal. I had a radio. I didn't have a television. And so I would listen to the BBC constantly. 
And at the time, what I was hearing about were the atrocities going on in Rwanda. And everyone in the U.S. was hearing about the O.J. Simpson trial. I came back home for my brother's wedding. I think it was the end of 95. And I had a haircut that one brother said, you look like Marsha Clark. And I said, who's Marsha Clark? A haircut that one brother said, you look like Marsha Clark. And I said, who's Marsha Clark? (laughs) Which... You know, obviously she was, I guess, the prosecutor. So I was completely out of the loop on those types of stories. But when I would mention, have you guys been talking about? So having this international experience broadened the input coming in to your life. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you still rely on that today? Absolutely. I work with an international company now, and I very much follow what's going on in that country. And I also uh, so uh, believe that we are a global economy. You have to pay attention to what's going on everywhere in the world. It, we are, we're all connected. No doubt. I think the U.S. is the same. I mean, would you make that same observation today that we're very focused on ourselves and, and what's happening here and that and not the- be true for a lot of people? I think that one thing could happen. I wish that students who finished high school would be offered an opportunity to spend a year abroad to give a different perspective. I think that even if it were just a year of service, that could nervous, that could make such a huge difference in our understanding of international relations and how we all play a part in every piece of what happens from the global economy to climate change. Do you think you felt that way before you had this experience or do you think this experience? I did. Again, I have so many siblings and they are all really bright. I'm lucky to be part of a family that has always been connected to news and international events. It helped to broaden what I understand. And do you think that it's changed what I understand? And do you think that it's changed the way that you consume news as well? Do you think you were, before you went, were you as interested in global affairs and international news as you were after this experience? To some degree, yes. I was interested in the international. I was interested in the international news. Was it as readily available as it is now? Absolutely not. And of course, the internet has opened us up to so much in what's happening worldwide, we we can't ignore it. We absolutely have the opportunity if we're willing to. You mentioned that that you were a little bit depressed when you got back. Do you think that that's a natural, is that unique to your experience? Is that something you think other Peace Corps volunteers experience when they suddenly are back home? I don't believe so. Some of those Some of it was about the idea of coming back and missing the people and missing the routine. Oddly, it was the first time I had ever lived alone in my life. I had always either had roommates or, you know, lived with a a group, a very large group of people as a child. That was a new experience for me, and I wasn't sure what would come next. So, where did you return to? Did you return to a fresh city? Did you live with siblings? Like, where I, did you go? I ended up in Atlanta with my sister for about six weeks. My, um, the woman I met in the Czech Republic, who it, who it was also a Peace Corps volunteer and who became my spouse, uh, joined me in Atlanta. And we moved west to stay with some Peace Corps volunteers in the Bay Area because I wanted to live out west. So I did try a new city. So what do you think started to turn around your, your feelings? I'll do, what do you think started to, to turn that around for you? Another adventure, just the idea of, okay, this is not, I don't, this doesn't feel right either. Let's get going. I basically, my spouse, Bridget, showed up with a backpack and everything else that we brought West, else that we brought West or took West was stuff I had in, in a, storage place. We got rid of a bunch of stuff. We packed up a bunch of stuff and moved west and then began to find our way. It was, again, another 
place we both landed and we're not sure what we were going to do, but we're both willing landed and we're not sure what we were going to do, but we're both willing to see what would happen. And we had a network of volunteers, Peace Corps volunteers who had returned, who said, come stay with us. We'll help you find your way. And it is always about just trying things. And if you, it's not always the first thing. And I believe you learn good lessons everywhere you go. So I try to take what was good and try to continue to improve. So did I just hear you say you fell in love over there? I did. I didn't think that that was what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Bridget actually was one of the later groups. I was the first group that went in. We were the first group of business volunteers and we were a group of people who would be placed in Czech and Slovakia. When she came in, she was a specific group of Czech volunteers. And I think she came, she, she went in as an environmental volunteer and ended up teaching at an environmental high school. And we met because I was invited to speak to this new group of volunteers, but I didn't really think anything about us meeting until she, until she contacted me about working with women's organizations and wanted to learn more. And that was when we began to develop a friendship. I didn't think anything would come of it. I just figured, well, it's Peace Corps, you know, it'll go away at the end of this. And, but it didn't. And in the interim, what was really fun was the internet came into our lives and we got mail. So she actually returned to the U.S. before I did. And we communicated through email that I had created slash set up at the organization where I was. And so that allowed us to get into something more. That's a beautiful story. Uh, that I'm is so not an uncommon story. There were, <laughs> there were many couples in my group, but there were also uh, many volunteers who fell in love with Czechs and who are still there. So I do have friends who are still in country who married uh, native, Czech married uh, native Czech citizens and who have remained and are incredibly happy. And of course, as you know, the Czech Republic is uh, known for Prague very much so and is absolutely a beautiful country. Now it's a tourist destination, mm -hmm. which is really I'd love great. to go actually. Mm -hmm. which is really I'd love great. to go actually. I um, really would. You do let me know. I still have a I lot will. Of <laughs> I would call no one else. Do you tell your story to others? Do you, do you say, I spent some time in the Peace Corps? Maybe in the beginning I did. What I found was that most people only really want to talk about themselves. And that's okay. I get that. So I, it's not a story I tell very often. I don't believe that Peace Corps really is as, and maybe I'm wrong about this, that it's at the, this, that it's at the forefront of people's minds the way it was maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. It's 60 years old this year, I think. So it's not, it's not the same kind of focus that we remember growing up. I'm wondering what kind of reaction you get from an MBA to, to that choice. It just it seems very unique to me. So I'm just wondering what the reaction is when you say it. The people who know me know that. And many of those people are the ones who basically did the same thing. I don't necessarily like I'm so unique in that respect. I think that the most difficult change is the one that you don't want. <laughs> so for me, it was one that I wanted, and certainly when I first arrived there, I was feeling the, the insecurities of, I don't think I know what I'm doing, and that kind of stuff, and sort of feeling very insecure, but got in and said, okay, I'll, I'm going to figure this out. I have a brain, and that's the most important thing I need here, and I can ask questions, and there are lots of people who are supporting me. They want this. And that was the great thing about Peace Corps. They really did want you to be successful. And they made sure you had funding for certain projects 
it wasn't necessarily that you got all the funding, but you got seed funding so that you could then go somewhere else and say, we've got this much, we need this much more. How can we make this happen? And so what would you say to someone considering choosing the Peace Corps today? I still recommend it whenever I can, especially to people who are coming out of university. That piece of it is one that definitely, I believe, like I said, that piece of it is one that definitely, I believe, like I said, I believe an international experience is key. I absolutely believe in getting out of your comfort zone because it gives you so much confidence when you have success. And I had plenty of failures. I, and again, there are many things that I wish that I could have done better. I was young. I also believe that there should be no age limit and there's not. We all know Lillian Carter joined Peace Corps when she was in her eighties. So, and the oldest volunteer in my group was 73. That's valuable to have all ages. That's valuable to have all ages and all competencies. I do wish that it were more open for low income people because I believe that the experience would would really help expand the confidence that feel it would it would give them an opportunity to see that there is more for them. And so you think it's not inclusive of the lowest income brackets? No, not Can at all. Can you tell me a little more about that? I don't know enough to to know why well, that is. It's there, like I said, you go in, you have to be debt free. They typically they typically want a university education. There are not programs that say come in with a high school education, which is unfortunate. I think that there could be some that are more focused on trade. If you had people who were going in with those kinds of skills, which are usually community college area. I also know that there are a few people of color who are often involved. It's predominantly Caucasian. I had, we had one black volunteer in our group, I think two Asians, and that was out of 30 volunteers. That's, that's a, that's a pretty small percentage. And that's unfortunate because those different perspectives are important. I don't know how that's changing now. So let's wrap up by going back to something that you said earlier. You said, you know, that this was a change that you made by choice. This was a change that you made by choice. And that mm -hmm. sometimes the bigger changes you 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 don't choose. I, I'm just wondering, let's get a little philosophical for a minute and just kind of comment a little bit more on that. Well, think about where we are right now. We just went through went through, I say just went through, we're still in a pandemic. People had to shift from working in an office to working from home. That was probably fine for a very large number of people. It certainly put a great strain on working mothers who bring for the household and for homeschooling their children, et cetera. That's an awful lot to expect. And now we're reversing that with returning to work. So for the last year and a half, everyone has gotten comfortable with that now normal, new normal. They're shifting back to what used to be, still with a lot of uncertainty though. And I think that's hard for many people. The, the idea of change, I think in general is difficult. I think you know that based on us having this conversation. One of the things for me, though, is conversation. One of the things for me, though, is I, I believe I'm just, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with it. I'll go with the flow. That is not necessarily true for everyone else. Thank you so much for being my guest today, Fran. And thank you for joining us today on Digging Deep, True Stories of Big Change. I'm your host and principal researcher from Insight Farm. At Insight Farm, we help companies make their products better through conversation and connection with consumers, often told as stories like the one you've heard today. If you'd like us to help you with consumer research, or if you'd like to participate in this podcast and tell your story, reach out at www.arm.com. We look forward to the conversation.